joined by Christchurch Little Rock, um, where Reagan Sutterfield, our guest forum speaker, is a priest. Uh, welcome to you all from Little Rock. Uh, so happy that you are here to join us. Um, a couple notes about uh, today's forum. Uh, parts of this, uh, we're going to break up into small groups for a few minutes for um, a little bit of discussion time and then join back together. When we get back together, that part of the uh, the presentation will be recorded and posted on YouTube. It's on speaker view, so only the speaker uh, will be uh, uh, recorded, but uh, just to let everybody know that this will be posted. So somebody else uh, from St. Columba's or Christchurch Little Rock wasn't able to see it. Um, uh, they'll be able to see it and catch up. This is a three week uh, series of um, workshops, Reagan, is that the, <laughs> is that the right time? Yeah, I think, I think workshops the best, uh, cause we're going to be trying to have a conversation together. So not, not just, uh, a, a one way presentation though. I'll be doing a little bit of that too. Awesome. Well, um, oh, let, let's start with, uh, welcoming our, our, uh, speaker today. Uh, the Reagan, Reagan, Reagan Sutterfield is an Episcopal priest in the diocese of Arkansas. He is the author of Wendell Berry and the Given Life, This is My Body, and Cultivating Reality. Uh, Reagan is a priest at Christ Church Little Rock. Reagan and I were in seminary briefly together for a year at Virginia Theological Seminary uh, and became good friends. And I am absolutely thrilled um, and, uh, to have him here at St. Columbus and to think about creation, um, environment, and our uh, a journey of faith. Let's begin with prayer. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let's pray. Holy God, your mercy is over all your works. And in the web of life, each creature has its role in place. We praise you for the owl, cactus, kelp, lichen, and whale. We honor you for the whirlwind and lava, tide and topsoil, cliff and marsh. Give us hearts and minds eager to care for your planet, humility to recognize all creatures as your beloved ones, justice to share the resources of the earth with all its inhabitants, and love not limited by our ignorance. This we pray in the name of Jesus, who unifies what is far off and what is near, and in whom, by grace, the working of your Holy Spirit, all things hold together. Amen. Reagan, over to you. All right. Well, welcome everyone. It's it's so good to, to be with you on this Sunday morning. And over the next few weeks, we're gonna be exploring the soil. And we're gonna be looking at that from a scientific perspective, but, but also from a, a spiritual perspective that helps us delve into this ancient Christian virtue of humility. And my hope in all of this is that this will help instill in you a, a sense of empowerment and hope for what might be done um, facing the kind of ecological catastrophes um, that we are up against in this age. As I was thinking about this presentation, you know, I thought about, um, you know, there's, there's kind of a narrative that if you watch any documentary or um, you can just start off with all of the, all of the terrible things that are, that are going on in, in our um, ecosystems and uh, all around the world. Uh, there, there's some some great books that that rehearse all of that um, from Elizabeth um, Colbert's um, field, field Notes from a Catastrophe to some of the um, a, a book with, with titles like The Uninhabitable Earth, and um, and so there can be a lot of doomsdayism, um, and, I, and I think that the the problem is absolutely serious and, and critical. But what I want to do is to to look with a, a kind of spiritual and theological lens at what we might learn from our scriptures and from our tradition, particularly in the Christian faith, of 
of how we might learn to live on this earth in a way that um, honors the whole of creation and also begins the work of, of healing that I think we're, we're called to. And essential to that, I think essential to our faith is the question of love. And I think part of our problem with how we, we've treated the whole of creation is a, a lack of, of love for particular places. And this happens in part because we have become so abstracted from the, the economy that we're, we're involved in. Um, we don't know the, you know, if I'm, I'm, I'm here at a wooden desk, I have no idea where the wood for this desk came from. Um, we are separated from the particular people and places where um, most of our, our goods come from. And, and that can be a, a, a source of our damage because when we don't love particular places, we don't care for them. Now, I've found that as I've talked to people who do care deeply about the created order and, and the natural world, that most people have an experience of some particular place, usually early in life, um, maybe in childhood, that they really fell in love with a particular corner of creation. And so what I'd like to do to start us off, because I, I want this to be a, a workshop and conversation, and sometimes it helps if we can, since we have a large group here, if we can kind of break off and, and have some smaller conversations together. What I'd like to do to start with is to talk about a place where you discovered a love for creation um, or the natural world. And um, I wanna be careful about language here. It's, it's, th there are a lot of terms that can be thrown around it. It could be hard to, to use the right language because um, creation is more than, than just nature. Um, it, it, there, there's an intentionality and, and even I think as we'll get into later on, creation itself was um, is a reality that is born from love. And so there's, there's a inherent meaning within it. And, um, but, but sometimes I'll, I'll use them a little bit interchangeably, nature and creation, but, um, but just know that um, underlying that is the sense that the world is, as, as the poet and farmer Wendell Berry says, the world is given. Um, and we live given lives in a, in a given world. And we'll be getting into that a little bit more later in, in um, one of the later sessions. So to start with the question that I would like you all to um, talk about in small groups, and we're gonna break into this in a moment, is what is the place where you really learned to love a particular part of, of the created order? Um, it could be um, like for me, I had a, I had a place behind um, my house when I was, um, when I was a kid. And um, when, when I was, um, it, it was my first place where I learned environmental activism because when I was about 10 years old, I called the EPA on my neighbors. Um, Cause <laughs> there was a, there was a little woodland behind, behind our house and I would go there every day. And I, I knew where a possum had a den and I knew where all the, the birds lived and um, where a Chuck Wills widow roosted up on a, on a pine tree branch and all of these things about this particular place. And one day I found um, this creek that had just been filled up with, with oil and, um, and there were a lot of dead animals around it. And, it, and, and I came in and told my mom, I was really upset. And she said, I don't know what to do, Reagan, just call the EPA. And, um, and so I, um, came into the, the kitchen a little bit later. And I was like, mom, the EPA wants to talk with you. And, um, and so um, that, that was my, my first, uh, first act of defense um, for, for the, a place that I had learned to love. Um, but I'm sure that all of you have, have places that, that you really learned to, to love the creation. So we're gonna break into to small groups now. And the one problem with this question is that I find that most people can talk for probably the rest of our hour about the particular places that they love. And so, so let's just name the, the place and when you first encountered it and one feature that you loved about it, but try to keep your, your response to about a, a minute and a half. And I know that's gonna be hard, but so that um, everyone in a group of, of about five or six will get a chance to share. And we'll, and we'll do that for about um, 
seven or eight minutes and we'll and we'll come back and right before the the when when we everyone gets kicked back into the the big the general session um, you'll get a you'll get a 60 second warning so um, that will be your cue but um, let's uh, let's divide into some small groups All right, are we all back together now? I think so. Okay. I think so. Good. Well, um, I hope I, no one got got cut off um, from from sharing an important place to you. But I, um, in the group that I was taking part in, I, one of the one of the themes that I heard, um, and I think there's a common common theme in these kinds of questions, is a is one of kind of at homeness um, in a particular place and a, a sense of discovery and wonder. And um, I think that 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 sense of at homeness is is a really important one. And it's something that um, I think is is part of our whole story within within our Christian faith is a, a story of people who had a home, lost a home, and then have searched for a recovery of that home. And I think that um, there's this, this fundamental desire for relationship and relationship connected to a particular people and place. And that can be manifest in all kinds of different ways. But I think that our, our ecological crisis is really one um, that blends this reality of, of, of a broken home of a broken relationship with our home. And then also um, stemming from that, a, a problem of our inheritances and, and how do we understand and deal with our inheritances? So all of us have inheritances, um, whether they are good, um, maybe a genetic trait or, um, or something that, that kind of comes down to us through our, our family lore or something that we have to, to deal with in a, in a negative way, um, like the, um, you know, the problem of the climate crisis is one that none of us here thought up one day and, and just created, but it's, it's been for 200 years in the making and, um, and yet we're inheriting it and, and have, to, have to determine as each generation does what they're going to do with their inheritance. And so I think that that question of home and inheritance are two that I hope you'll you'll hold on to as we think about um, what our response to the ecological crisis should be. Now, um, this this question of of our our place and our our, the, our connection to particular places um, is is one that that is. Goes goes down to the the fundamentals of of who we are um, as creatures and particularly as human beings, and I, I want to to offer a quote um, about kind of where this crisis comes from, um, and this comes from Willie Jennings' book, the the Christian Imagination: Theology and the Origins of Race. And this is a really important book. It's it's a little dense, but it's um, but it's a, a really important book looking at where the idea of race comes from. And, um, but there's a deep ecological connection here because how we think about human bodies and how we think about the body of the earth and the world and can, is, is interrelated. And, um, and Jennings really makes that point strongly. So he says that um, what, we, what we have, um, particularly as, as contemporary people, is a loss of, um, and, it, and it's a loss of, in, in what he calls the social imaginary, like how we think as a society, how we imagine ourselves. And um, he says that, that this is an abiding mutilation of a Christian vision of creation and our own creatureliness, an abiding mutilation of a Christian vision of creation and our own creatureliness. And he says, this loss is nothing less than the loss of a sense of our own creatureliness. And he says, I want Christians to recognize the grotesque nature of a social performance of Christianity that imagines Christian identity floating above the land, landscape, animals, place, and space, 
leaving such realities to the machinations of capitalistic calculations and the commodity chains of private property. And that, that's kind of a mouthful there, but, um, but I think that but what, what, what Jennings is, is saying essentially is that that sense of connectedness and that sense of at-homeness that we might've felt as children in these places that we talked about that we love, that that, that has been lost and that so often our faith and our understanding of who we are as, as Christians um, has been completely separated from that being a part of creation. And we've imagined our faith as this escape from the created order, escape even from our own embodiment. I mean, we think about, you know, the old um, gospel hymn, I'll, I'll fly away, you know, um, there, there's this sense that our spirits will, will, will become something different and, and separated from the created order that, that God uh, made and, and called good. And that our, our faith floats above land, landscape, animals, place, and space. And so we don't have a sense of that, that deep connection. Now, part of this comes from the colonial era and, and some, some theological realities that, that, were, that entered into um, in, in more recent times. But the scriptures have a story that, that helps us understand that there is this kind of this has been a problem from, from very early in, in the human story. And, and part of the, the efforts of, of theologians of the past going all the way back to the, the writers of the, the Torah um, is, is how to reconnect us to the, the earth and, and how, to, how to help us become once again at home in that, in that place. And so that's, that's where I'm gonna, when I wanna turn um, with us now, um, with, the, with, the, with our conversation now. And I wanna do that by, by looking at um, the, the two creation stories in the book of Genesis. Um, I know that many of you are, are, um, have had a lot of experience studying, studying this, the Bible and, and you've noticed before that there are two creation stories. Um, but um, just to, as a reminder that Genesis one creates this, is the creation story that kind of is looking at the big picture of the cosmos. And it was probably written by a different writer than Genesis chapter two. And the, the, the belief of, of many biblical scholars is that there are these different stories floating around and there was someone later on, um, probably in the time of Babylonian exile when the, when the people of, of Israel were, were living in Babylon in exile, away from their homeland, um, away from the temple where they were able to exercise their faith in its fullness. But there was someone who brought these, all these stories together and, um, and, they, and they did a great job of kind of like just letting each story stand by itself. Um, even, even when they're, they're, it creates some confusion, but they just kind of, it's, it's kind of a, a, a mishmash of all these different stories. Um, but Genesis one and two have a have a have a wonderful, I think, insight to offer us in understanding our place in, in the created world. So um, Genesis one, um, you know, is the familiar story of the creation of um, spaces and then the different um, realities that will fill those spaces. So. Um, we, we have you know space and um, light and dark and then we have the, the bodies that that live the sun and the stars and uh, the moon and the things that then occupy those those spaces and then we have land and then the animals and plants that will occupy the land and then seas and and all of the the creatures that will live in the seas and the, um, but what some scholars have have come to to recognize in all of this is that the pattern, is actually a pattern that resembles the nature of the temple. Um, so there, there are many contemporary biblical scholars that think that Genesis one is sort of this picture of the whole creation as being a temple. Um, and when human beings are given that famous um, call to dominion, um, that um, is, is how it's been translated often, um, that many people see as a as one of the things that really has been at the root of our abuse of, of the created order because that we've had that view. 
um, some of these contemporary scholars see that call to, to dominion as actually being a, a, a way of seeing the human being as, um, as a kind of priest within the created order, that the, the role of the human is to, is to be someone who calls creation to worship and celebrates um, and, and encourages the, the beauty and, and fullness of creation's flourishing so that it, it might worship God um, fully. There, there's a wonderful um, Eastern Orthodox theologian who's, who's written a, about this called named John Zizioulis. Um, and he, he wrote a great piece called uh, Proprietors or Priest of Creation. And uh, his answer is that we are not the proprietors of creation. We're not the owners of creation, but we are instead to be the, the priest. So when we get into the, the second creation story, that's the story of how human beings were, were formed. It's this, this story that kind of zooms into the, the creation of the human being. And, and it's also the giving of, of a, a vocation, um, a calling to the first humans. Um, it's when, when human beings get their job. And um, here we have the story of God making, of creating the human creature from the earth. Now, um, there's there's some interesting words at play here. Um, so I don't know if you all know um, the, the word for Adam is, is really a general term for, for a, it's kind of like saying earthling or um, a, what I prefer actually is humus being. Um, and I'll explain that in, in a moment because the, the Adam um, is formed from this soil called the Adama. And um, the, the Adama is this really amazing um, life-giving soil. You know, the people who, uh, who wrote the, the Bible were people who were agricultural. They, they knew that there were different kinds of earth out there. Um, they may have known the categories that we soil scientists now cl classify things as sand, silts, and clay, but they also knew that there was soil that could give life. And then there was soil that was just inert and, and didn't, um, offer up any life. And so their word for agricultural soil, what we might call humus soil, like the compost, the, the rich, dark, um, earth, their word for that was the Adama, um, and so the Adam comes from the Adama. And, and of course we have that, that relationship between those two words in English too. Um, the human comes from the humus. And, and that, that's an etymological tie that, that human beings come from the earth. And it's, it's not just any earth, it's the, the good life-giving soil of the earth. So, um, so we're told in this Genesis two story that that the human being is formed from the um, from the Adama, and and that's that's important for us because I think the biblical writers through this through this kind of narrative are trying to offer us a picture of what our relationship to the whole of creation is supposed to be that we are formed from this life giving soil, and then we're given that the human being this the the Adam is given this vocation within the Garden of Eden. Um, and the vocation is, um, it's often translated as to till and to keep it. Um, so a little bit of soil science um, on the side. The worst thing you can do for your soil is to till it. Um, and and this, is, this is something that, that um, there's, a, there's a really, um, this is, there's a big movement um, that's trying to, to show this in, in many ways. And there's a wonderful book, if you're interested, called Growing a Revolution by the geologist named uh, David Montgomery. He's a MacArthur Genius Award winner. And um, he gives this great um, picture of people who are in this no-till movement. Um, but they're, they're, they're people who, when you, when you till the earth, you are disturbing all of the, the wonderful ecosystems that are, that are beneath the soil. There's all kinds of fungi and, and um, bacteria, nematodes, and, and we'll, we'll look at that in, in a little bit. But um, when you till the earth, you're, you are 
disturbing that ecosystem. And so it's better to, to do what, are, what what's called sheet mulching or composting on, on top of the surface. Um, and you can develop the soil in that way rather than, than tilling. Now, sometimes tilling is okay in a, in, when you're first establishing a, a garden bed, but, um, but so there, I say that because um, when, when the Bible says that the, the vocation of the human being is to till and keep the, um, the earth, I, I wanna kind of push back on a, a little bit different way of understanding that word. Um, so in Hebrew, it's a um, it's a bod um, is the is the word that's used there for to till, and that word could also be used um, in Hebrew to for service. People who are servants um, would would issue um, a vod. Um, so there's this this way of, of translating it as to serve the earth. And then that word to keep it is um, could, another way of understanding that would be to preserve the integrity of it. Um, so the human vocation formed from the earth is to serve and preserve the, the earth, the, the, the garden um, of Eden. And, um, and I don't think that that's a vocation that's gone away. I think that's part of the reason that humans seem to enjoy so much being a part of um, creation, of watching animals, um, and 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 caring for them and 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 caring for a garden. I think there's something in us that that draws us toward that, and that's this this vocation, this call to serve and preserve the earth. Um, so I want to pause there and ask: if, Are there any questions at this point? Um, and I think you can, um, Joshua. You you tell me how the how the questions go. Yeah, everybody has the power to unmute themselves. And also um, uh, writing something in the chat uh, is is great too. One of us, uh, one of the co-hosts can kind of relay that to Reagan so he doesn't have to worry about um, multitasking, but yeah, so two different ways. So any, any questions about what, what we've talked about so far? I have more comment. It seems okay. that um, Native Americans have a much better sense of this oneness with the, um, you know, with with the environment. Yes. Well, thanks, Lori. And and there there is, um, you know, Will, um, Willie Jennings talks about how indigenous people um, around the world have. Um, often a, a deeper sense of their place in a in the land, um, and how in many ways, and this and this, I know that um, St. Columbus, you've been doing a lot of work on on racism, and 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 we have here at Christchurch as well. And there's a there's a sense in which whiteness can be a way to um, to displace us. Um, this idea of whiteness can become this kind of separate place where meaning and identity is formed rather than the the very land where we where we live and um and so that that's that's a um i think i think a really um important point to to look at and and even to to understand how um so i think looking at land-based communities is a really important way to to learn for ourselves those of us who have been displaced um to, to learn again how to how to respond because um, because there there is this um, that this need for we we all need to learn to be placed again and so we need to look at indigenous communities to learn how to do that. Hey Reagan, there's a question in the chat from Chris Moore that says how or when did the translation of till come to have dominion over to serve or preserve? Um, so uh, the answer to that, I do not know. Um, and I, I, I think that, um, you know, it does, it can mean to cultivate um, the earth. And um, of course, you know, they didn't have tilling in 
biblical times in the same way that we have it, but there is this sense of cultivation um, that, 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 that's with that. And um, so I don't know the history of the, of the translation so much, but, um, but there, you know, every generation has its own questions they come to the text with. And I think that biblical scholars here working today are kind of coming to the text and, and with these contemporary questions of, of ecological catastrophe and trying to um, look and see if there's, there's help that can be found from um, the biblical text. And, um, and so you, you kind of become awake to certain things um, like, like a difference in, in the possibility of a translation in that way. So I'm not sure um, when that came about, but I, I will say another, a book that gets into a lot of depth in exploring some of these themes is um, Ellen Davis. She's an Episcopal biblical scholar, teaches at Duke, and she has a, a book called Scripture, Culture, and Agriculture, an Agrarian Reading of the Bible. And um, it's, a, it's a really good, good book for, for delving into a, a variety of biblical text um, and some of these questions. Yes. Uh, another question in the chat, which is um, from Christopher and Elizabeth Faden, um, asks, can the story of the expulsion from the Garden of Eden be read in part as a story of our separation from our connection to our um, Adama roots? Yes. Well, so Christopher and Elizabeth, thank you. That's a perfect setup for the, <laughs> um, the next part that I wanted to get into. Um, so there's this, so as I said, you know, Adama is is this one word for soil, but of course they had other words for soil, and uh, just just as we do. And it tracks the the words in Hebrew actually track very well with the difference um, that's that, that's in soil science. Um, and there's a there is a technical difference in contemporary soil science. I mean, it may seem silly because these are such common words, but there is a technical difference between soil and dirt. Um, so soil is this living and life-giving reality. Um, dirt is this inert material that, um, that just doesn't have life in it and doesn't, doesn't have the kind of coherence that, that, can, that can help foster and give life. And you can convert dirt from into soil but, and, and soil back into dirt. Um, and it all depends on the kind of ecological relationships that are, that are happening around it. Um, there's a, in, in David Montgomery's book that I mentioned, he offers a great story about this, um, this man in, um, in Africa who's helping people move away from some of the, the conventional, especially chemical dependent um, forms of agriculture and into more of a, a soil focused Way. And he said that the guy had a, a hat on that said, got dirt, get soil. Um, and so, so there, there's this, this difference. Well, in Hebrew, they have the same, the, the same kind of reality. So there's, a, there's Adama and then there's a par, and that is the dust um, is, is how it's often translated. And, and that's very close to how we understand dirt. It's this inert material. And you'll remember that when um, the, the Adam um, and Eve are, are, are forced out of the garden, one of the consequences is that they will return to their dust. Um, and, the, and the word that's used there is the apar. Um, Psalm 103 also has a really wonderful um, offering of, of this in that um, in I mean, Psalm 104, excuse me, um, in Psalm 104, there's this, this wonderful passage where it's talking about all of creation and how creatures look to God for their life. And God is providing the breath of life to all creation. Um, but then when God turns away from the, the creatures, they return to their dust. So it's kind of like uh, this apar or this dirt is what happens to us when we are separated from the whole life of creation, which includes um, God's sustaining of, of the whole of creation um, through this kind of breath, breath of life. And so, so that's, a, um, that, that, that's an important element of this, this story. 
So, um, so hopefully that that helps. So uh, uh, I don't see any other questions, but it sounded like in the chat, um, but it sounded like maybe someone was about to ask. Uh, well, I'm not sure how much time we have. This is Greg Drury. Hi, Reagan. Um, I'm just curious, you know, I've been in the environment field for a long time as it, just as a nonprofit, but, and I always noticed that farm to table disconnection you know, where we don't really see where our food's coming from. Mm -hmm. But also since the isolation or what I like to call the solitude <laughs> since COVID, I spent numerous hours in uh, meditation, contemplation and prayer and stuff. And I'm noticing more and more that that connection is, you know, in the Eastern sense, just seeing yourself in other things. And I, I, I might be getting into you know, one, going from 101 to 103, and you might be discussing this later, but I just wanted to get your take on, you know, when you sense yourself, when you see yourself in other things, which is very Eastern tradition, you know, you, you actually feel more connected to that and you feel one with it. And, and then you feel like you need to steward it and nurture it along and so forth. So any thoughts? Yeah, that, that, that's a wonderful comment. And I, I, um, I very much agree. And, and, and I'm going to leave you all with a, a little bit of an exercise um, to, to do this week um, that, that I think we'll, we'll get to some of that. But, but one of the things that I think is, is part of this is um, this, this connectedness is when we come to understand that our lives are, are deeply connected and dependent upon the life of the soil. And, um, and so it's not just this reality that, um, you know, we read about in a book from, from long ago, but when they, the, the, the biblical writers were trying to speak to a living reality that, that continues for us now. Um, and and we, we absolutely can see it when we, when we come to the table and we acknowledge all of the connections that uh, with with the earth that that brought this food to us, and um, and that we in in our best way, like when 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 a human being is living into fullness, um, we are drawing our life from the soil and the sun, um, but we can't we're not direct uh, we can't directly draw energy and life from the sun, so we have to depend on plants to to help us do this. Um, so all of our nutrients are coming from the soil and from, from sunlight that are then converted for us through um, plants and oftentimes also animals that are eating those plants. And, um, and, and so we, we are like, our, our bodies are made from the, the, the earth and from, from the sun. And how that happens, we're going to get into a little bit more next time. But I, but I would like to to just start a little bit with with some of the um, some of this. So let me. So this is a good good opportunity to to talk a little bit about what um, what we get involved with when we start to pay attention to the soil and um, the whole of creation that we become connected with. And 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 as you said, oftentimes once we start really looking at all of this. It's harder to pinpoint where we end and the rest of creation begins. And um, there's been a lot of attention paid in recent years to the human microbiome. And you know, a good portion, most you know, even more than half our cells are are made up of of other creatures um, that inhabit our bodies including a lot of bacteria and, um, and, and even fungi um, that make our respiration and digestion. And we wouldn't be able to live without all of these other creatures. Um, and, um, and, and so this is, a, this is a reality that is kind of changing a, a, a sense of even our personhood. Um, I like, it, it has some interesting theological implications that I'll get into more later too. But um, I like to say that, you know, the, um, that the first member of the body of Christ was probably um, some sort of bacteria. Um, 
because literally if, if, if we believe that, that Christ is, you know, the incarnate, um, as a human being, then to be a human being is to be someone who is made up of all of these other non-human, um, creatures. But, but, but again, the, the, the difference between that all becomes difficult because none of us could live independently of one another. So we are all connected in this, in this whole, and that, and that reality is very much at play also in the soil. So, um, I'm going to try to share my screen here. Um, and all right, so you're all seeing a, a slide here that says the soil food web. We sure are. Okay. So, um, so this illustration is a very famous one um, from several years back, but it, it, it's it's still um, used quite quite a lot. It's uh, it comes from a, a little USDA um, pamphlet on um, the soil food web and soil ecology. Um, co-authored by, um, I can't remember who the co-author is, but one of the authors is Elaine Ingham. She's a very well-regarded, um, famous um, soil ecologist who's really pioneered a lot of the work in, um, in the soil food web. And I've been um, taking a course um, online for her, from her over the past year on, on compost in the soil food web. Um, and so this is, a, this is a simple kind of diagram of how this all works, but but essentially, um, you know, this is a, this is a look at what um, Adama soil is is all about, humus soil that from which human beings are drawn. Um, we have you know the sunlight coming down, and we have plants that are gathering energy from the sun and can actually convert air and sun into matter, um, which is this um, amazing ability that plants have. They they can they can grow from sunlight and the air, but they also need nutrients um, from the earth itself. And this is something that, that people often miss. You know, we think about adding fertilizers into gardens. You know, you might hear the, the famous nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, those are the, the NPK. Those are the things that, that any garden needs. Well, the reality is that most soils in the earth have all of the NPK that any plant could, could need. The problem is that they are not bioavailable. They're not soluble. So, so the NPK is not available to the plant to use. So what makes all of that, that material that's there in the rock or in the sand or silt or clay, what makes it available for the plant? Well, it's, um, it's all of these little creatures, um, the bacteria, the fungi, the, the nematodes, um, the, the microarthropods, um, the protozoa, they're what make, make it available to the soil. So plants are actually kind of in control here and they put off this, this kind of way to describe it as kind of like a sweat, um, but it's a sugary sweat um, called an exudate um, that, that's right around here. And this is a little place uh, soil scientists call the rhizosphere um, from the, the word rhizome uh, for root. So, so right around here in the rhizosphere, this plant is putting off this sugary material and um, if there's sufficient organic matter in the soil, it helps because um, it creates a food source that draws in these bacteria and these fungi um, that begin to break down the, the material in the earth and make it available for, for the plants to use. And um, so the bacteria and, 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 and fungi are drawn in and, and they can actually they can do all kinds of amazing things. Like there's some bacteria that can like emit electrochemical pulses and draw plant roots down toward themselves. Um, there are fungi that can help um, actually like break down rock and um, and and use create acids that will they'll break down materials and make them more available for the plants. Um, but then all of these things get eaten by nematodes and um, and other um, and, and protozoa and, and then arthropods. And then those all get pooped back out. Um, some scientists call this the poop loop. Um, and and that in, in doing that, it's breaking down the material more and more and more so that it's then more available for the, for the plants. So good soil is a community. Um, the, the Adama soil is a community and, um, and there's all this life in it. And, 
there's all this life in us. And so fundamentally that that's that's the reality of both the human being and the earth. Um, we share this reality that we are fundamentally a community of life. And um, next time we're gonna get into that a little bit more and understanding kind of more of what that community of life looks like and, and, and how the Christian spiritual tradition can help us understand it through this, this idea called kenosis. Um, so humility is part of the title of the wisdom of humility. So where does that all come in? Um, so humility is literally going close to the earth, paying attention to the earth. And, um, and it's by doing that, that we can, we can become fully human beings, humus beings, um, drawn from the earth. And so, so this is, so this is what we're, um, or being being um, drawn towards this the the earth we're being drawn towards is this this uh, Adama. So the the assignment that I'd like you to do this week is I would like you to find a patch of ground about the the circle of um, a circle of a, a hula hoop, and I'd like you to spend at least twenty minutes just looking at it. Um, if you can find a forest um, piece of ground, that would be great. You can dig around in it, but just don't use a tool. Don't use a shovel or anything. Just use your fingers, like look under the leaf litter. Spend 20 minutes with that and, um, and just use it as, a, as an exercise of meditation. So we'll, 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 be, um, we'll, we'll be doing that um, uh, next, look, following up on that next week, but I know our, our time's out for today. Fantastic. Reagan, thank you so much for a penetrating, thoughtful, um, uh, presentation and workshop. Everyone, especially a big welcome and thank you to our friends at Christ Church Little Rock for joining us today. Look forward to seeing you all again next week. Um, same uh, great time, same great place. Uh, let's close in prayer real quick. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let's pray. Almighty God, fill us with your created order. Fill us with joy and compassion and courage. May we be a witness to these things, to all people joining us to you in a great plan of reconciliation and love and peace. In your holy name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, I learned a lot. First peace, everyone. Thank you all. See you next week. Thanks. Reagan, thanks a lot. See you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you.